all of you are requested to take your seats please the chief guest has started from his place and he'll be here any moment please maintain discipline and please take your seats सो मां ज्योतिर्गमय सेठ आनंद राम तम सो मां ज्योतिर्गमय सेठ आनंद राम जयपुरिया ग्रुप ऑफ एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशंस कैरीज अ लेगेसी ऑफ मोर देन 77 इयर्स इन द एजुकेशन डोमेन द विजन ऑफ सेठ आनंद राम जयपुरिया टू प्रमोट एजुकेशन वाज कैरीड फॉरवर्ड बाय हिज सन पद्म भूषण सेठ मुंतुराम जयपुरिया and grandson dr raja ram jaipuria today shri shishir jaipuria is carrying forward the legacy of empowering the new generation shri shishir jaipuria is also the chairman of fiki arise the vertical of fiki which takes care of the interest of independent schools jaipuria group started its journey with seat anand ram jaipuria college in kolkata established in 1945 inaugurated by pandit jawahar lal nehru today the group runs 16 k12 schools four preschools two management institutions and a teachers training academy across north india the group's network is spread across 15 cities and has the strength of 20000 students 15000 alumni and more than 800 educators Kinney Filaments Limited is a flagship company started by Dr. Rajaram Jaipuria in 1990. It is one of the largest textile units in India with a turnover of more than 1000 crores. The group has four manufacturing plants at Kosi Kala, Haridwar, Bharuj and Noida. Established in 1974 and ranked number 1 in Kanpur and number 2 in Uttar Pradesh by Education World 2021-22 Seth Anandram Jaipuria School Kanpur is the most sought after school in the city Seth Anandram Jaipuria School Ghaziabad was established in 2004 and has a wide base of 5000 students Seth Anand Ram Jaipuria School Lucknow established in 2016 has gained enviable reputation for its digital interventions it is the first microsoft showcase school in the city and one among the 200 microsoft showcase schools in the country little one the jaipuria preschool is a great place for toddlers to learn through play with focus on interactive sessions Hello. Jaipuria Institute of Management Ghaziabad was established in 2001 with a clear vision of developing the capabilities of young managers in a global environment The institution is among the top 3 colleges in the state by Dr APJ Abdul Kalam Technical University The B school has been accredited grade A by NAC for its commitment to excellence and offers an AKTU approved 2 year full time MBA program in various specializations 
Jaipuria School of Business, Ghaziabad, was established in 2008 with a vision of transforming young minds to make them future ready. The Institute's commitment to excellence was recently recognized in 2021 with an award for the best management college in India for placement by Integrated Chamber of Commerce and Industry, ICCI. In 2020, amidst the COVID pandemic, Sait Anandram Jaipuria Group launched a teacher's training academy called Samarthya Teacher's Training Academy of Research, popularly known as STAR. The academy has still now provided more than 40,000 man-hours of training across 400 schools through more than 150 training sessions. A few remarkable contributions were to provide ICT training to 10,000 teachers of government schools in UP and to train educators on future learning systems and digital leadership. The group is determined to foster quality education and prepare the youth of the country for Industry 4.0. Sait Anandram Jaipuria Group of Educational Institutions Empower Enthuse Excel Tamso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Sait Anandram Jaipuria Group of Educational Institutions carries a legacy of more than 77 years in the education domain. The vision of Sait Anandram Jaipuria to promote education was carried forward by his son Padma Bhushan Sait Munturam Jaipuria and grandson Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria. Today, Sri Shishir Jaipuria is carrying forward the legacy of empowering the new generation. Sri Shishir Jaipuria is also the chairman of FIKI Arise, the vertical of FIKI which takes care of the interest of independent schools. Jaipuria Group started its journey with Sait Anandram Jaipuria College in Kolkata, established in 1945, inaugurated by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Today the group runs 16 K-12 schools, 4 preschools, 2 management institutions and a teacher's training academy across North India. The group's network is spread across 15 cities and has the strength of 20,000 students. 15,000 alumni and more than 800 educators.
morning and a very warm welcome to the fourth Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture. I, Vedika Shukla, extend my heartiest welcome to each and everyone gathered here on this momentous occasion. Good morning to one and all present here. I am Ritisha and it is my pleasure to welcome our chief guest, Honorable Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi Ji. Dr. Joshi has been a towering figure in the field of social, educational and political landscape of the country for more than five decades. We are indeed privileged to have him with us to deliver the fourth Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture. Heartiest welcome also to Sri Shishir Jaipuria, the Jaipuria family and friends, members of the Jaipuria group of institutions, teachers, students and distinguished guests. Education is the foundation upon which the future of humanity is built. This wise thought by Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria resonates with us even today. Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria was a visionary educationist, industrialist and philanthropist who dedicated his life towards building a strong India. His enduring vision and legacy is celebrated each year through Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture. All lectures have been on the important themes pertaining to India's growth and emergence as a strong nation and a developed superpower. The theme of today's lecture, the fourth one in the series, is Building a Sustainable Future Through Education. To commence the lecture, on an auspicious note, may we request the distinguished chief guest, Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi Ji, Sri Shishir Jaipuria, Sri Mati Sunita Jaipuria, Sri Sake Jaipuria, Sri Yash Jaipuria, and family members to light the ceremonial lamp. the students of St. Anandram Jaipuria School, Ghaziabad, to invoke the blessings of Goddess Saraswati with a melodious Saraswati Vandana. Thank you. 
ವರದಿ ವರದಿ ವೀಣಾವಾದಿನಿ ವರದಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ರವ ಅಮೃತ ಮಂತ್ರ ನವ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ರವ ಅಮೃತ ಮಂತ್ರ ನವ ಭಾರತ ಮೇ ಭರದಿ ವರದಿ Dr. Rajaram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture was launched in the year 2019 to pay homage to the late philanthropist, industrialist and educationist Dr. Rajaram Jaipuria. The lecture is an annual event that features an illuminating discourse by an eminent personality on a subject of national significance. The topic of each lecture represents the progressive vision of Dr. Rajaram Jaipuria. Born in 1934, Dr. Rajaram Jaipuria was an inspiring entrepreneur whose zeal for nation building manifested in different aspects of his professional and philanthropic life. He was a leader par excellence in managing industries like textiles, sugar, synthetic fiber and education. While presiding over one of the largest conglomerates of textile empire, he nurtured a strong desire to contribute to the growth and development of the country through various modes. A man rooted in traditional values, Dr. Jaipuria was equally a strong proponent of the progressive thought. He desired to choose the medium of education as the most powerful tool to serve the nation. Pursuing this vision, he took seat Anandram Jaipuria group to great heights by setting up institutions in all verticals of education. Today, the group has the strength of 17 K12 schools, four preschools, two business schools, and a premier teachers training academy named Samarthya Teachers Training Academy of Research or STAR. Dr. Rajadam Jaipuria also remained actively engaged in several philanthropic projects which included establishing the Jaipuria Smriti Bhavans, affordable guest houses for pilgrims in the holy cities of Haridwar, Vrindavan and Chitrakoot. In the year 2000, he was instrumental in establishing Ram Darshan, a monument in Chitrakoot dedicated to the life and work of Lord Ram. A coffee table book on Ram Darshan was released in 
by the Honorable President Sri Ram Nath Kovind. To pay an illustrious tribute to the distinguished life of Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria and to honor his legacy, Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture was conceived by his son, Sri Shishit Jaipuria, in the year 2019. The first Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture held on 38 April 2019 was delivered by Mr. Venkaya Naidu, the former Vice President of India in New Delhi, on the topic education, entrepreneurship and ethics. My dear brothers and sisters, I am extremely happy to be here today this morning at this magnificent convention center named after Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedka to deliver the first Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture. I am therefore glad that the ideals and values which Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria ji upheld all his life have been carefully nurtured by his successors, by his son, grandchildren and other family members and we all have assembled here to celebrate his idea of empowering the next generations through quality education. The second lecture held in virtual mode on December 5, 2020 was delivered by Mr. Nitin Gadkari, Minister for Road Transport and Highways, Minister of Shipping and the MSME Government of India. Its topic was very appropriate for the country that was overcoming the pandemic, the role of leadership in turbulent times. डॉक्टर राजाराम जयपुरिया जी के स्मृति में मैं अभिवादन करता हूं जिन्होंने अपने जीवन में एक विजन के साथ उद्योग क्षेत्र में तो अच्छा काम किया ही पर स्वाभाविक रूप से उन्होंने शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में भी बहुत बड़ा योगदान दिया है The third lecture was delivered virtually by Swami Swarupananda the global head of Chinmaya Mission on March 5th, 2022 and it provided significant insights on the topic building a strong and resilient India through visionary leadership. Beyond these memorial lectures, Sage Anandram Jaipuria Group is making a real difference in the field of education by conducting regular events, virtual sessions, conclaves and summits that feature distinguished luminaries from different fields. Renowned policy makers have shared their vision of India's future growth on our platforms. Social reformers have fervently expressed their views on changing the country at grassroots level. Famed sportspersons have inspired their young aspirants to pursue their dreams. Best-selling authors have delved into the richness of Indian mythology, Indian culture and the country's emergence as a superpower in the 21st century. Carrying forward this tradition of highlighting the issues pertinent to growth and sustainability, the fourth Dr. Rajaram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture is being delivered by the eminent political veteran Shri Murli Manohar Joshi Ji. The topic of the lecture is Building a Sustainable Future Through Education. The theme resonates with the current scenario of multitude of global challenges and highlights the productive role education can play in creating a bright future for all. Seat Anandram Jaipuria Group of Educational Institutions always committed to quality education and nation building. Empower, enthuse, excel.
request the chief guest along with Sri Shishir Jaipuria and Sri Yash. to deliver the welcome address. Sri Jaipuria is the chairman of Sait Anandram Jaipuria Group, which has been in the field of education for more than 77 years. Presently, the group operates in all verticals of the education landscape and runs 17 K-12 schools, 5 preschools, 2 management institutions and a teacher's training academy. Sri Shishir Jaipuria is also the chairman at FIKI Arise, the vertical of FIKI which takes care of the interest of independent schools. He is also the CMD at Guinea Filaments Limited. Over to you, sir. डॉक्टर मुल्ली मनोहर जोशी जी आज के समारोह के मुख्य अतिथि सभी माननीय उपस्थित अतिथिगण जयपुरिया समूह से जुड़े हुए सभी लोग शिक्षक एवं समस्त छात्रगण और मीडिया के सदस्य आप सभी का जयपुरिया परिवार की तरफ से बहुत बहुत नमस्कार सर्वप्रथम मैं मुख्य अतिथि डॉक्टर मुरली मनोहर जोशी जी का हृदय से आभार व्यक्त करना चाहता हूं कि उन्होंने चतुर्थ डॉक्टर राजाराम जयपुरिया मेमोरियल अभिभाषण देने के लिए सहमति दी डॉक्टर जोशी जी राजनीति की दुनिया में एक प्रभावशाली व्यक्ति हैं उन्होंने कम उम्र में सामाजिक सक्रियता के माध्यम से राजनीति में प्रवेश किया और 1977 से सांसद सदस्य बने साथ ही उन्होंने सामाजिक क्षेत्र में महत्वपूर्ण काम किए और शिक्षा के बढ़ चढ़कर अपना योगदान दिया उन्होंने एच और साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी मंत्री के रूप में अपनी पूरी निष्ठा से देश की सेवा की और डॉक्टर मुरली मनोहर जोशी जी ने वर्ष 2014 से 2019 तक कानपुर निर्वाचन क्षेत्र से सांसद के रूप में रहे कानपुर से हमारी भी जड़ें जुड़ी हुई हैं हमारा पूर्वज 1945 में कानपुर जा, जाकर बसे थे और वहीं से जयपुरिया विद्यालय की नींव पड़ी है इसलिए हमने कानपुर से जोशी जी के द्वारा किए गए अच्छे कार्यों को देखा है डॉक्टर मुरली मनोहर जोशी जी के साथ में मेरे परिवार का बहुत मधुर संबंध रहा है मेरे दादाजी पद्मभूषण मंगतूराम जी जयपुरिया और मेरे पिताजी डॉक्टर राजा राम जयपुरिया जी शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में उद्योग में और देश और राष्ट्र निर्माण के लिए अधिकतर जब भी भी उनको कोई चीज बात करनी होती थी तो जोशी जी के पास जाते थे और उनको समस्या का समाधान इमीजिएटली मिल जाता था मैं व्यक्तिगत रूप से डॉक्टर जोशी जी का बहुत सम्मान करता हूं हाल ही में जब मैं उनके पास समारोह के आमंत्रण के लिए गया तो उन्होंने इस इस, इस निमंत्रण को सहर्ष स्वीकार किया और सहमति प्रदान की लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन 
Dr. Joshi has been an ardent advocate of sublime Indian values and ancient scientific knowledge. He has been a protagonist of the holistic view of science and philosophy and has delivered lectures at several international forums and conferences. In 1993, he represented India at the International Youth Conference held at Chicago to mark the 100th anniversary of Swami Vivekananda address to the Parliament of Religions. Given Dr. Joshi's impressive credentials, we are pleased to have him amongst us today to deliver the lecture on building a sustainable future through education. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Friends, we believe that it is an extremely important subject in the context of several social, cultural, geopolitical, and environmental challenges the world is today grappling with. Since times immemorial, education has been a catalyst for the rise of great civilizations. The ancient Egyptians reached the pinnacle of architectural brilliance by mastering the knowledge of geometry, mathematics, and astronomy. The Greek civilization witnessed a zenith of philosophical, artistic, and scientific achievements that formed the legacy, unparalleled influence on the Western civilization. India, which is among the oldest surviving civilizations in, in human history, surpassed all the others with a treasure trove of spiritual knowledge and wisdom immortalized in the text of the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Puranas, the epic of Mahabharata, the Ramayana and the Gita. Great thinkers like Panini, Pingala, Patanjali, Shrustrata, Bhaskara, and among the pioneers who made a seminal contribution to the global repository of knowledge. India was home to eminent universities like the Nalanda, Takshila, Vikramshila, and Vallabhi. Our great nation was truly a Vishwa Guru to the world. The rise of the Western civilization was founded on the underpinning of scientific knowledge, which manifested in the Industrial Revolution and later into the Digital Revolution. It has engendered the information age and the age of artificial intelligence. Today, education is reaching an interest an interesting inflection point. The world is increasingly recognizing the need to look beyond the knowledge and to inculcate among the learners a set of values, skills, attitudes, and self-awareness. My father, Dr. Rajaram Jaipuria, in whose memory this lecture is conceived, believed that education should blend the modern knowledge and the ancient wisdom seamlessly. He was a visionary educationist, industrialist, and a national builder. While he established institutions delivering world-class education in prominent cities of North India, he also made a conscious endeavor to preserve and promote Sanskrit language and Vedic philosophy. My father was instrumental in setting up institutions offering education up to Acharya level under the aegis of the trust, Bharatiya Chaturdham Ved Bhavan Nyas at five religious places, namely Badrinath Rudraprayag, Prayagraj, Puri, Dwarka, and Rameshwaram. His vision to provide holistic learning by embedding our culture, ethos, traditions, and ancient wisdom into today's pedagogy finds echo in the vision of the National Education Policy 2020, which aims to instill among learners a deep-rooted pride being Indian and shape progressive mindsets for global sustainability. Friends, today, 
three fundamental trends are being witnessed that will shape the future of education. Firstly, there is a rising demand for global problem solvers. This is due to the fact that the world is witnessing a new set of global, societal, and environmental changes. These challenges are enshrined in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Secondly, as technology advances and creates disruptions in industry and academia, students will need to be equipped with high demand skills and the future of jobs. And lastly, lifetime learning is no longer a choice. It is becoming imperative for anyone who wants to thrive in the face of increasing lifespans and industrial challenges. Progressive educational institutions like ours are taking the lead in defining the new paradigm. We adopt a multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach to teaching and learning. New age practices like socio-emotional learning, project-based learning, outcome-based learning, and computational thinking are central to today's pedagogy. Beyond, acad beyond academic excellence, educators today are focusing on building in learners the 21st century skills, such as problem solving, collaborating, critical thinking, communications, creativity, innovation, and global citizenship, along with short, soft skills like empathy, compassion, and self-awareness. Educators and teachers are evolving from being gatekeepers of knowledge to choreographers of learning. They are emerging as facilitators, as enablers, in guiding students shape their desired learning experience and journey. The big question before everyone is, will the new age education be potent enough to sufficiently address the global challenges and create a sustainable future? How will education be the agent of positive change in a world marked with social, economic, industrial, and economic challenges? And lastly, how do we go about creating an equitable world through education, a world of gender equity, decent work, innovation, good health, responsible production, positive climate change, peace, and justice? We look forward to arriving to some of the answers to these questions in today's memorial lecture by our eminent chief guest. I believe that all the 17 SDGs education is perhaps the only one that will have an all-pervasive positive influence on other sustainable goals. Therefore, it is of utmost importance for our education system to become central to creating solutions to global problems, helping future generations and embracing global mindsets and skill sets. I also believe that India presently stands at an important crossroad to become a leader in creating sustainable solutions. We all know that we have become the fifth largest country in terms of GDP, and very soon we will be likely to become the third largest country by the year 2030. We also know, we also know that in our country, we have the largest ecosystem with regard to education, in which more than 26.5 crore people go to the school system, and close to 4 crore people go into the higher education. And the new education policy, which has recently been pronounced in 2020, talks about increasing the gross enrollment ratio in higher education to the extent of 50%. So there are tremendous amount of opportunities that we have, tremendous amount of new vision and direction which the policy has given. And I'm sure with the implementation of this policy, India will be able to reach a threshold which we are thinking and become one of the biggest countries in term of, terms of economic development that we and our prime minister envisages. 
it is up it is up to us to save these young minds as the agent of change it is up to us to nurture the knowledge the skill the values and disposition that will support responsible commitment to sustainable development and to realize the ideal of prasudev kutumbakam enshrined in our upanishads the verse 38 in chapter 4 of bhagavad gita says nahi gyanena sadrasham pavitrane vidyate it means there is nothing in the world as pure as knowledge as pure as education ant mein main fir dr mulli manoj joshi ji ka aabhar vyakt karta hu ki jinhone chaturth dr rajaram jaipuriya memorial lecture ke liye समय निकाला मुझे आशा है कि उनके संबोधन से हमें सब को, सब लोगों को कुछ सीखने को मिलेगा डॉक्टर जोशी जैसे विद्वान व्यक्तित्व के विचार और विजन भारत के विश्व गुरु बनाने के लिए बेहतर बेहद महत्वपूर्ण होंगे धन्यवाद thank you very much sir for deliver delivering that thought provoking address and setting the right tone for the memorial lecture it is a privilege to now invite dr murli manohar joshi ji to deliver the keynote address dr joshi dr joshi is a visionary who embarked on a political career through social activism a highly educated and erudite leader he has been a professor of physics at the university of allahabad he was the minister of human resource development from 1998 to 2004 one of the distinguished veterans of the bjp dr joshi is also a recipient of the padma vibhushan the second highest civilian award dr joshi Dr Joshi was also awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Science by five universities. He was awarded the best parliamentarian award by Lok Sabha for the year 2009. In 2014, Dr Joshi received Russia's highest civilian award, Order of Friendship. Dr Joshi has had more than 140 research papers published in various national and international scientific journals. More than a dozen students have worked with him for the Doctor of Science and PhD degrees. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge round of applause for Dr Joshi. <laughs> सबको मेरा अभिवादन और हार्दिक नमन श्री शिशिर जयपुरिया जी और उनके परिवार तथा श्री मनोत्रा जी और उनकी संस्थाओं के सभी प्रमुख टीम लीडर्स और प्रिय छात्र और छात्राओं सामान्य तौर पर मैं हिंदी में ही बोला करता हूं लेकिन जो विषय इन्होंने रखा उसको उसकी शब्दावली को अभी हिंदी में उस स्तर पर अनुदित नहीं किया गया है इसलिए बोलचाल में या सामान्य भाषा में तो उसका उपयोग किया जा सकता लेकिन जब इन्होंने बताया कि इस कार्यक्रम में केवल छात्र और छात्राएं नहीं होंगे बल्कि बहुत से बुद्धिजीवी 
उद्योगपति और शायद ये कार्यक्रम आप अन्य संस्थाओं को शायद जूम के माध्यम से देख रहे हैं तो फिर मुझे कुछ अपनी पुरानी इस शैली में बदल करने की आवश्यकता महसूस हुई है तो इसलिए अब मैं भाषा का लिखित अंश सामने रखना चाहता हूं पर इससे पहले मैं ये बता दू कि जब श्री सुशील जी मेरे पास आए थे तो मैं कोई अच्छे स्वास्थ्य की हालत में नहीं था इसलिए मैं जो शुरू कर रहा हूं उसमें उसका भी थोड़ा सा उल्लेख करना चाहूंगा नाउ इट इज ए इंडीड अ ग्रेट प्रेजर फॉर मी to address this morning such an enlightened and academically oriented assembly gathered from renowned educational institutions situated in different parts of this state and northern india initially i was quite hesitant to accept this invitation due to my health but because of the sweet persuasion of shri sushil ji and my respect for the japuria family and particularly for late sri raja ram ji in whose memory this lecture is being organized and with whom i had a very long association i had no other option but to accept this invitation i may confess that even today i am not in a proper frame of health and as you know the added goes a sound mind in a sound body so i might not be delivering a lecture from a sound body i will try to coordinate the mind and body if to the extent it is possible for me i do not want to deal with the uh, jaipur ya family and their contribution to india to Kanpur to industrial sessions and sections, and to the education, and especially the contributions made by Sri Raja Ram Jaipuri Ji. Much of that has been shown, and I think much more can be shown because of the paucity of time. It's only a small, uh, small piece of his uh, attainments and his contributions were shown. what does he say but what i consider is that one of the most important part of his life that he turned out turned around a situation which was normally supposed to be impossible that is the part of his life which i think the students must be made know how he converted the whole opportunity into a much better future that is something very strange that is the striking part that is the ennobling part that is the inspiring part of his life and that is i think another aspect where he could challenge the onslaught of a political decision which converted all the i may say earnings and and accusations into just into dust and from there he revived it and made a, a, a totally different uh, life for the company and for himself dr rajaram japuria's interest in education social welfare and philanthropy acti activities were phenomenal and the most profound guiding let 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 motive of his life was we make a living by what we get but we make a life what we give now this is something very important with which we must remember that which made his vision of his life for his future life and uh, he was a spiritual person and he had great interest in promoting the cultural spiritual and religious values of this country and as you have shown seen the foundation of a 
Ram Temple in Chitrakoot. As a matter of fact, it was Sri Nanaji Deshmukh who introduced me to Sri Jaipurya and the other members of the family. So that way, <laughs> I have a very long association with the with Sri Jaipurya and his uh, life lifelong ambition to create a <laughs> new India based on Indian values. And I'm happy that the entire Jaipurya family has ardently espoused the vision of upholding India's rich cultural heritage while at the same time embracing the modern in all its good aspects. It's a combination of the ancient and the modern. I am glad to note that the 77-year-old legacy is now being carried forward under the able leadership of Sri Shishir Japuriya. Sri Rajaram Japuriya ji, as you have known, was a great entrepreneur and he encountered numerous adverse positions, adverse uh, situations, and he very successfully uh, feathered all those storms. I pay homage to that great Karma Yogi, Dr. Radharam Japuriya. Now I have been asked to speak on building a sustainable future through education. Now there, there are three words in it words, education, sustainability, and future. So I would try to I say dissect my ideas in three parts. Now the aim of education is twofold, collective and individual. At the collective level, the aim is to make an individual into a good citizen. It is a, that is a person with harmonious relationship with other members of the community, a person useful to the society, and the one who fulfills his obligations as a citizen. And I'm talking not only in context of India, but I'm talking in a global context. That is how a citizen should be perceived from the standpoint of education. At the individual level, a person or a student expects an educational institution or educational system to help him develop a strong and healthy body, build his character, attain self-mastery, and support him, supply him with opportunities to discover and realize his natural abilities. One of the most important aspects of education which we are nowadays completely forgetting is the harmony between body and mind, and later on, also the spirit. But both expectations are justified, but it is necessary to understand the relationship between the individual and the society, and that the aspiration of the need to be mutually harmonized, the aspiration of an individual and the aspirations of the society the aspirations of a country, the aspirations of the world. So you have to harmonize. So the education must lead to such a situation where this harmonious relationship is maintained or rather it is also further. The human mind tends to emphasize on one or the other. And the current domination thought is that individual interest must be subordinated to the societal interests. Now this is something very peculiar, that you are trying to subjugate an individual to the societal. You want to create an individual not for his own personal, his own personal feelings or his moorings, but from the point of view of society. But you are saying so many intellectual persons are needed in this section. We want so many electronic engineers. We want so many climate engineers. We want so many skilled um, um, computer trainers. So what you are trying to do is subjugating the personal instinct, the personal qualities, the personal 
what you can say the direction in which an individual wanted to grow to the societal needs. You say, no, India should produce so many computer engineers, so many chemical engineers, so many business uh, accountants, or so many business managers. So this is how you are trying to create shape the society. That is, is something important which has changed. I think that we have to consider this point very seriously. And India has done it, I think, in the very dawn of its civilization, how to solve this problem. So the very dawn of human civilization, the Indian mind, had reflected on the nature of the universe and every constituent of the physical world around us and also their interrelationship and had discovered the fundamental unity of entire cosmic phenomena. This was perhaps the first enunciation of the holistic nature of the universe. In this approach, the human persona is not only a body, but it is a continuum of perpetually and mutually interacting body, intellect, mind, and spirit. I'm not using the word soul because people in other parts of the world they do not understand the real meaning of the soul. They use the word spirit. But in India, in Indian jargon, we use the word atma. Holism, therefore, tells us that all objects and events in the physical world are interdependent and inseparable parts of the cosmic whole. This is the most fundamental principle of our understanding of universe. How to interpret? The Western mind has understood it as a machine. Their understanding is universe as a machine, the mechanistic model of universe. But what we say is not me me mechanistic, but it is holistic. And that says that holistic view therefore demands that mankind must learn to live in peace and harmony with the environment. Because environment and mankind are not separable. They are part of the same universe. As a matter of fact, can you conceive the existence of human body without environment? Or what is the meaning of environment if there is no human being to utilize the bounties of the environment? Therefore, the Indian mind has said long back, thousands of years ago, that these two entities are inseparable. They are the same. And how they said it? They said any, they decided that any educational system must take into account the inseparability of humankind and human environment. Indian mind had therefore realized and explained this relationship by declaring what which is in the macrocosm is also in the microcosm, which he says, normally you use that word, Am Brahmasmi, that what I am in the cosmos, so I am in the body. The scientific word is now saying is that whatever is in the macrocosm is also in the microcosm. That is a human body or any particle in the universe is a representative of the universe as a whole. The holism says it, that each part of the whole has the miniature universe in it. Therefore, we say, Aham Brahmasmi, I'm the same as the universe. And this thought philosophy had ultimately led to the famous doctrine of Vasudhaiv Kutumbakam. Because now we are not separable, we are inseparable. That is, world is a family. So now take the, the right from the beginning, but you say that we want so many people to cover this aspect of market. Market demands this. So they, you, you are creating a family, not a family, but a market. So you have to consider whether the education should create human beings fit for a market or fit for a family. There is a fundamental difference between a family and a market. In a market, you can only come with some money in your purse or in your, but you say, accounts nowadays, whatever it is, but without that, you have no place in that. You will be thrown out of market if you go without money. 
you have only existence in a market so long you are an economic being in one way or the other. But, but in a family, you will be welcome. A market will not welcome you. A hotel will not welcome you without money. But a family will welcome you. You reach a family even at midnight and knock the door. Some person will say, ask you. First they will say, Aye, please, who are you? Kaanse aare ho? Baito? You will not say, you have the money in your pocket or not. I have not seen Indian families. There may be families in the other parts of the world. But in India, a family would first ask, Kaan se aayo? Kya maamla hai? Kyo aayo us raat? Reza bhai, mujhe kuch chahiye, paani chahiye, ya chahiye, rasta bhool gaya ho. Something like that. But you will not throw him out. But in a hotel, you will be thrown out. There's a kuch hai. This is the fundamental difference between you see. So the world is a family and is not a market. You start from the very beginning. So you have to see education for what? For creating world as a family or world as a market. So this is, a, I think, an important point with which educationists in India should keep in mind. For whom are you educating and for what? So now world is a family and we also realize that the relationship between an individual, that is the microcosm, and his environmental, both societal and natural, are symbiotic and organic. You can't say that <coughs> the relationship between an individual and the rest of society is economic. It is functional, no, it is emotional. Now, to an extent, I will go one step forward, it is spiritual. India has recognized the spiritual relationship between human being and all environment, whether it is animal environment, or whether it is a plant environment, or when we should you call it the, the, the inert environment and the cosmos. They say, no, we are part of the same family, of the same system. You cannot separate one from the other. So if the educational system does not produce a mind like that, I think it's going uh, to something in a direction which does not suit the Indian experience of human civilization. I don't say that uh, I may uh, give you some very interesting aspect of uh, education. How, how we should uh, think about developing human mind. And for that, I will quote Bertrand Russell. He pointed out that the physical universe is continuously expanding according to the astronomers. What the astronomers are telling us about the expanding universe. Everything that is near us is moving away. And the farther it is, the speedier it is. Everybody is, every, the universe is moving. Everything is moving. And the farther you are, the greater is the speed. Something very interesting. Hmm? So everything that is nearest is moving away, and remoter things are receding even farther. So we have to stretch our imagination, both in space and in time, to an extent unknown before. The expanding universe. We are part of the universe. You see, I started from that that we are part of the universe, or rather, we are the universe itself. And then the science tells us that the universe is expanding, expanding with great speed. I don't know how much speed, but still, it says. I don't discuss about this Milky Way, Milky Way and others, but the distance of each of these galaxies and others is so so vast that it takes about 2 million years for light to traverse. And it's still, still expanding and expanding. The sun, our sun, luminous sun, weighs about 2 billion, billion, billion tons. And the Milky Way weighs about 160,000 million times as much as the sun. This is, the this is what you can observe. Milky Way, you can observe. 
the intensely huge part of the universe is empty, or very nearly so. So the mind has to stretch its utmost to even begin to understand this vastness. You are living in a you are part of a universe which is so vast which is not between you and me, which is not just a family, which is not just a business, which is, which is not a company, but it is something huge of which you are a part. You may feel that you are a very small part, but still you are part of a huge cosmos. This is mind-boggling expense for a human being now in 21st century. Now a moment's thought. I may say that even in India, some of the yogis have a comprehension of the vastness of the universe. They have. They have described it. Now, a moment's thought about the cosmic theater fills us with awe. But at the first reaction is over, the rational mind realizes that there is no great quality that is essentially connected with the size. Because you are a part of the universe, therefore, with this small apparatus, you can comprehend the universe. So a universe, education must take us to that height. And I will say that if the intellect becomes cosmic, but feelings and his emotions remain local, a disharmony would be produced which would be disastrous. That is, in effect, the wisdom must grow. Wisdom can be said to be harmony of knowledge, emotions, and feelings, which does not come out with the growth of knowledge. It means if you are having a huge library or a set of computers, you have become knowledgeable? No, sir. Knowledge is something different. So this, is, this has to be borne in mind that the difference between education, knowledge, and the space which you have to cover, your inner space and the outer space, and they must be harmonized. So the name game of the, the educational institution must devise such things and uh, not only confuse with the problems of every day, but think about the future of the universe, the part of which you are there. Are we moving in sync with the universe? Are we also moving with the same speed? I'm not. When I was teaching you, and that's day, whatever I taught you has become now redundant. And what you read has now become redundant. And what I, my younger students, and some of them who are sitting here, might be knowing more than me about the, that's what you call the handling of the so-called this uh, I, I am, uh, this I, I, the, the, um, the, the, this new technology, they handle it very fast. Sometimes I find a kid, two, three years ago, also handles a com computer-like device without difficulty. When Mr. Dev Deepak was student, this was not known. Now what his children are knowing, he will not be knowing it. And what now their children will be knowing will be completely something different for me. For them, I am become a old foggy. Ah, you can't handle it. I can do this, 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 this. I can so many bites. I say I don't bite. But I say no, but the bite is the most important word, which I must know. So the, the that the question is that we must know that uh, the education must concern with the totality of life and not just have responses to the immediate challenges. Therefore, whatever challenges are being faced today, they might become obsolete after some time. So you have to be very careful and keep yourself at pace. But you can't do it in the physical space. For this, you have to create a mental space. Otherwise, I have a danger that uh, this question, whom do you want to educate and for what, has to be solved. What is the aim and purpose of this education? If you have to, for me, I have been raising this question for a large number of years, 
you have to decide whether you want to provide a happy, contented, peaceful, and creative society, or the one busy in the mad race for accumulating more and more material stuff and consequently degenerating into a ruthless and violent society with cutthroat competition. You have to decide whether humankind should remain happy, contented, peaceful, servicing for each other with love and emotions, or you want to have a material, materially oriented society with cutthroat throats, the competition, and also the violence. You see, the violence, the, the world today is much more violent. You see, these 90 years of my life, I find the world has moved from peace to violence in a much, much, uh, say, st higher steps. It's, it, is, it is impossible to conceive a world now without violence. Can you consider a simple, single question, say, a single country, a single society, even your own neighborhood? Are you safe? Are you peaceful? Are you happy? Or you are always envious, jealous? Now, these are the important aspects of human development. And for that, I think education and educationists must think very carefully. It's all about education. Now, something about sustainability. I don't know how much time is it. Anyway, but I must know this something to my house. I will skip those power portions which I can easily see. Now, what is sustainability? Sustainability, the dictionary meaning is simple. It says to keep in existence, to maintain oneself, to prolong your life or prolong whatever you, have, you are, to keep someone from falling or sinking or support the vitality and the strength and so on. So when you say about sustainable future, you are apprehensive about your future. That is the first big question which arises to my mind. Why, why are you sustainable? Because there is something wrong with the present. So it simply means that you want to maintain what you possess and want to keep it secure and do not allow it to further deteriorate and you want it to grow. Now in 1992 report, world scientists warning to humanity signed by more than 100 scientists, including 101 Nobel laureates from 70 countries. Human beings, what they say is human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage to the environment and to the critical sources. If not checked, many of our current practices put at the serious risk the future that we wish for the human society and the plant and the animal kingdoms and may also alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner we know it. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision of our present course will bring about. The warning was supported by, uh, in 2001, by World Bank and other institutions. And what they, what they said was that at an alarming rate of environmental degradation has occurred, and in some cases it is accelerating. Across the development world, Environment problems are imposing severe human, economic, and social costs, and threatening the foundation upon which the growth and ultimately the survival depends. In 1972, the then Secretary General of uh, UNO, Yutan, he warned that the world's current problems were already beyond anyone's capacity to control. Find it in 1972, the UN was, war was warning the humankind that the world's current problems were already beyond anyone's capacity to control. Or was he premature? Or maybe 
the confident statement of the 1982 World Commission on Environment was correct. The near one. The latest one is from Kofi Annan. Uh, Kofi Annan who also says it and ultimately says that environmental issues must be fundamentally repositioned in the policy making processes of countries, of societies, whether it is educational, whether it is <laughs> economic. Only when this is reflected in fully accounting these policies can economic policies assure that development can be sustainable, otherwise not. How can we make this development sustainable to ensure that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs? Mind it what I am saying. How can we make the present development as a sustainable one? Today is the day when we are talking of sustainable development. How can, how can we attain it? I say, how can the development be sustainable and to ensure that it meets the reason, needs of the present without compromising with the needs of the future? That is, we are not allowed. That is not sustainable development. That is destruction total. So, these are the questions which are for sustainability. How can these questions be answered? Yet it is important that everyone develop well considered answers to the questions above. I don't know whether people have tried to find out the solutions or not. But the problem to my mind arises because we do not recognize the fundamental principle that it is impossible to have finite growth on a limited planet. You cannot have a finite growth in a limited planet. Therefore, you have to redesign your concept of growth. What is the meaning of growth? How much growth? And for what? And in what manner? I will not deal with that aspect because that takes a little more time. But I keep it for you. The, the, the question to be decided by the educational institutions, by the technical institutions, by the political institutions. If there is no will in the political <coughs> systems all around the world, the international political system has failed. They have not been able to provide us the, what you call a sustainable environment. The dangers of environmental uh, holocaust is increasing every day. So how, how do you meet that? What type of education, what type of sustainable development? You? The only answer is that you must keep in mind that you cannot grow beyond the limits of the planet. The planet has a limit. Therefore, the conception, the concept in my, to my mind should be changed from development to consumption. Rather talking about sustainable development, we should talk about sustainable consumption. That is a consumption which can be provided to the largest number of human beings, but also to the environment and also. India, we had been trying right from the edges. No, we know it that we have to Replenish, replenish the planet uh, because if the, play, the, the fauna dies and flora dies, the human cannot exist. Can you survive without a cow or a buffalo or, or, or something which gives you fruits? You can't. You have to have a company, you have a family, they are all part of your family. And if you can say only we will stay and, and you will not let the tree be, trees be cut, let the, uh, this, this what you call, um, uh, this animal like the kingdom may be cut, we, we, can, we can eat all of them, there is no difficulty for us, but the new survive. So you have to keep the sustainability not in the way in which the western countries have decided, are forcing upon us. You must develop like this. How? How can we? Today India is 
one of the largest populated uh, population popula populated countries in five years or ten years time it may have and it will add few million more now how to provide food you may say you are developing but what about the food somebody has to provide somebody has to provide the um, other nourishments so how to do it and your land land is limited and you are expanding well you are growing but can that growth be sustained that is the main point therefore the cons the concept which i have been propagating for last at least 30 years that we must shift our whole whole understanding of universe and human existence from unnatural development to sustainable consumption unless there is a match within them that the sustainability of the consumption and the sustainability of the development they go hand in hand if you can create such a society that will be a sustainable society so we must think about this that that i think is something i know i know so now last word and that is about the future i am only quoting one paragraph from the lecture of dr anil kakotkar he was one of his one of india's greatest atomic scientists and the question was that we are talking of india becoming developed super developed more developed and ultimately in the category of the developed countries or maybe the highest developed country we are talking every day this is it's nothing wrong about talking and having all the all the uh, different understandings of uh, human society and nature it is not but now he says now for a practical from point of view when do you say that you are a very developed country then he says kakot kar says i am not saying anything but in this last page i am saying is not from me i am quoting verbatim from his lecture to me you want to see india as a developed country i would say a single line definition the standard of living of indian india indians should be comparable with the best in the world then i would say india is developed it is as simple as that that would mean not india becoming the topmost economy but that would mean that per capita income should be comparable with the best in the world then he says there is a huge difference between the two having per capita income and having a large income now i don't will discuss about that part of his lecture now it says if you look at the correlation between the uh, per capita income and the national income then you say there is a huge difference between the two take that aside if you look at this correlation we are talking about getting human development index comparable with those blue triangles countries with high quality of life let us look at the minimum
thousand terawatts to eighty thousand, twenty-eight thousand. How do you reach it? How do you reach it? I am not discussing its economy. I can discuss it. But you see, how do you? Do you? You think only that there are the the only way is to reach is to follow. Industrial patterns or the scientific patterns designed by different Western countries. You have to reevaluate about your situation, about your problems, and how much you can do it and at what time and whether it is desirable to reach and go in that direction or not. That is the question which I raise for future. What future you want? A future. Which is dependent on technology and money and so many other things on Western countries or different countries, or are you in a position to have something of your own? Can you give a new direction to the energy consumption? Can you find some other methods of producing low energy? Materials? Can you? If you cannot, I may. I am talking it now. Not now. It is my words. Then you will not be able to survive. That I am saying it. And therefore, for last so many years, I am saying that please don't follow this GDP model. That is disastrous. Markets will not decide whether you are happy or not. Today in the morning, I find Bachchanji is selling that cool gappa. Then in the morning, he sells a uh, this scooty uh, or a, or a uh, this car car. In the, in the afternoon, he sends a uh, uh, something else, some other model. So in the morning and in the evening, Mr. Bachchan, the one of the most celebrated. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, one of the most celebrated, and perhaps Bachchan is known as the father of the modern day acting. In the morning, I find him bhujiya khana, Bachchan ki bahut bhujiya acha lagti hai. Then I find that unko ye wala sharbat acha lagta hai. So, subah se shaam tak, how many times the personality of our, of our, of our icon is changing? So, what is this uh, market in the morning of Bombay? Where do you go? In the market, you find. I think now in Delhi it has also started. So we, dud ka dam, aaj itna. Dopeer ko dud ka dam itna. Sham ko dud ka dam. So the market does not give you the real value, the real, the real, uh, the real, the real content. It simply gives you an index, and that index may not be suitable to your culture, to your genetic code, as I say. You may, you may not be able to do it, and there is only one country, one country, which has given us a, a little hope, and I think that must be thoroughly discussed on on, on international matters. That is Bhutan. They said no, this GDP business is not correct. We should go for happiness index. How much is any society or any economic system is Making you happy, and therefore the question of happiness has to be decided. So the future of the world lies in finding out true happiness. All these other calculations, computations, may lead you to some more accumulation of that material stuff, but it may not lead you to a happy, progressive. Serving emotionally attached human society, and that's all. Is in the education must answer all these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your highly inspiring address, your enlightened views 
on creating a sustainable future through education is indeed full of great insights that will motivate us all to strive towards excellence and contribute positively towards nation building. We take this opportunity to now invite Srimati Sunita Jaipuriya and Sri Sake Jaipuriya to felicitate our chief guest, Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi Ji, with a token of gratitude. Joshi Ji, Dr. Joshi Ji is being presented with a special certificate. The Jaipuria Group is honored to sponsor the education of three underprivileged children in the name of Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi Ji. As a philanthropic, philanthropic gesture, Jaipuria Group of Educational Institutions takes regular initiatives to support the education of underprivileged children. I now invite Mr. Yash Jaipuria, member of State Anandram Jaipuria Education Society, to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. On this note, we 
come to the end of the fourth Dr. Raja Ram Jaipuria Memorial Lecture. We request everyone to kindly rise for the national anthem. Students, please be seated. 